Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a final year medical student at Cambridge University, and this is part three of our three-part revision tips Q&A series, where you guys sent in questions, and me and two of my medical student friends, uh, we answered them a couple of weeks ago, back when this channel was on like 10,000 subscribers. This video is going to be about how to prepare for university exams, but I think the tips will also apply to people with very content-heavy A-level syllabuses or GCSE syllabuses. Syllabi? Syllabuses? I don't know. If you look in the description, you'll find links to loads more videos that we've done about evidence-based revision tips, and if you haven't seen them already, I'd really recommend you watch the first one about active recall and the second one about spaced repetition. This video, this Q&A, sort of assumes you already know those very basic things, because active recall and spaced repetitions are by far the single biggest things you can do to really make your revision much much more efficient. If you don't know about those yet then please ignore this video, watch those first because without those tips it's like anything I say is going to be completely pointless. So in terms of structure uh, we're going to start this video with me giving you four tips for how to do well in university style exams, but as I said, I hope the tips will also apply to A-level and GCC students as well. And then in the second part of the video, we'll be answering seven different questions that you guys sent in a couple of weeks ago. And as usual, everything's going to be linked in timestamps in the, in the description below. Please don't watch this whole video. Please look in the description and like go to the appropriate timestamp based on the stuff that you think will add the most value to your life. Uh, this is probably going to be quite a long video, so I wouldn't like advocate you watching all of it. Firstly, I want to talk about the importance of scoping your subject. And we talked about this in a previous Q&A video, but I want to ex expand on it in a bit more detail here. Scoping your subject is really, really, really important. I've had a few messages from people over the last couple of weeks saying stuff like, oh, I've got, I've got 70 lectures to get through in the next three weeks. I don't know how I'm going to do it. The way you do it is by scoping your subject and make sure you have like this broad conceptual outline of all of the different subjects that make up your subject, all the different topics that make it up, and within each topic, all the important subtopics as well. And that's the very first thing you should be doing before you get started with any kind of revision at all. Because I think a mistake that a lot of university students make, and possibly this applies to A-level and GCC as well, is that you think, oh crap, I've got 70 lectures to get through, and you start going through them chronologically and just trying to make notes on them or trying to learn the lectures. But learning the lectures is not a very efficient way of kind of imbibing information into your brain. Instead, what you want to be doing is scoping your subject. You want to have a look through, just like a quick skim through all 70 of those lectures, and see if you can break it up into manageable topics. If your university is organized, your course will already be split up into various man manageable topics. So it won't be 70 lectures you have to get through, it'll be maybe 5 lectures on this topic, and 15 lectures on that topic, and then 12 lectures on that topic. And in total you might only have like seven topics. Now seven topics to get through in four weeks or however long you have is a lot more manageable than oh crap I have to get through 70 lectures. So firstly split up everything you need to do into di into manageable top topics and you can see more about my revision uh, spreadsheet space repetition system that's based around kind of doing one or two or three topics each day and then doing active recall of those topics. But the first thing that's really important is for you to have these topics down. Now once you've got this list of topics again don't think that oh crap, I've got 70 lectures to go through. Instead, you want to be thinking, okay, what are the main salient points of these topics? What's like the broad skeleton of each of these topics? Like, how would you summarize it in one line? Okay, now can you summarize it in five lines with a bit more detail? Can you summarize it in a single page with a bit more detail? Um, I think another mistake that people make, that I certainly used to make back in the day and that a lot of my friends used to make, we've now learned better. We would, we would focus on single lecture series or single lectures and try and learn the detail, like learn the lecture. And as I said earlier, learning the lecture is not very effective. Instead, we just want to be getting a, a broad idea of what was in that lecture, what the subheadings were. Right, in this lecture about diabetes, we talked about management, we talked about investigation. Done. Okay, in the next lecture, we were talking about insulin specifically and how the pancreas works. In the next lecture, we were talking about all the various diabetic drugs and their mechanisms of action. Done. All these these three lectures were quite long lectures, there's a load, a load of detail in them, but you know, we've just summarized it in one or two words saying what was in that lecture. And if we do this for every lecture, we get in our heads a very good understanding of what goes into our course. And then looking at past papers and looking looking at kind of essay questions, that sort of thing, we can start targeting the areas that we need to prioritize. So going back to this again, if you are in the position where you have 70 lectures or however many lectures to get through in a small amount of time, what I would suggest is maybe like give yourself five minutes per lecture and, 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 and stick to that only five minutes for each lecture. And in that five minutes, you want to skim through it and just kind of jot down the most salient points, write down kind of the, the topics and the subheadings that you want within that. If you spend five minutes doing that for all 70 lectures, that's 350 minutes, that can very easily be done in a single day, a single morning or an afternoon. And now you suddenly have a broad understanding of what's in the, what's in this entire, entire subject. So it's not 70 lectures to get through, it's, you know, targeted topics. I really can't state this more emphatically. It's really, really important to scope your subject. That would be my first tip for university students or if you're at A-level or GCSE and you have very content heavy stuff, scope your subject. The second tip is if you have essays in your exam, and I know in most university courses, the exams tend to be essay-based. If, if your exams are essay-based, then base your revision around 
planning essays. So again, going to the going back to this to going back to this lecture thing. Let's say we have ten lectures to get through. What we don't want to do is think right. I'm going to go through lecture one, and then I'm going to go through lecture two, and then I'm going to go through lecture three. Instead, take those ten lectures within a single topic, for example, and either using past papers, hopefully they've given you previous essay titles, hopefully you've had supervisions or tutorials or whatever where they've given you essay titles, but if not, kind of think to yourself, if I were an examiner, what kind of essay would I feasibly set on this? And then just, just like answer the essay question, like make make an essay plan and base your, your answer around these 10 lectures and around your further reading. That way, in the end, when you've done enough essay plans, A, you, if, if one of them comes up in the exam and the likelihood of that is, is pretty high, you've already planned like a really, really good essay for that. So you don't even have to think in the exam, you just regurgitate the essay you've already planned. That's the best case scenario. Though. Even if that doesn't happen, you will still have covered all of the content of the of, of the lectures, but you'll have done it in a, in, a, in a, a focused way, a way that kind of answers specific questions Therefore, you know you're targeting the material that's most important rather than kind of sometimes the fluff that we do see in lectures and in, and in wider reading. So firstly, you'll be targeting the content in a focused fashion. And secondly, there is a bit of evidence that shows that when you have this sort of structure where you're kind of structuring your revision based around actively trying to answer a question, actively trying to go for this goal of what is the answer to this question? How would I write this essay? That that improves your, your understanding and your retention of, of the topic. So there are lots of different benefits to using essay plans. That's the way forward. If you're in this position where you have lots of lectures to get through in a small, a small space of time and you know you're exam is based on essays, then prepare for the exam. As bad as it sounds, you know, if if you only have a few weeks until your exam and you're concerned about your exam, the exam is what you need to be preparing for. Yes, university is for wider learning and for wider experience and this, that and the other. But really, you know, there comes a point where we have to focus on the exam. And focusing on the exam means if it's an essay based exam, just do lots and lots of essay plans, structure your revision around those. Thirdly, very quick tip, uh, if you're doing like maths or physics or engineering, I've had a few messages from people uh, doing those subjects asking how do you use your active recall method for maths and physics. I don't know, I don't do maths or physics at university. Uh, I wouldn't use my spreadsheet method of active recall writing questions for myself if I were doing maths and physics. I'd be focusing on problem sheets and on past papers because that is, you know, it's it's applied stuff. That is what tests your knowledge of it. Although having said that, my brother did maths and he made lots of flashcards for various proofs. I understand in maths and in some of these subjects you have to prove various things. And obviously you don't want to be deriving the proof from first principles in the exam. So you want to memorize the proof. And you can do that using Anki, using any kind of flashcard, using a spreadsheet, spaced repetition system. Again, more on that in videos that will be linked here and, and in the description below. And finally, I want to get onto one of the most important points for getting through university life in an efficient and stress-free way. And that is to really make use of people in the year above and in the years above that who have been through the course before you. And if you've ever tried this, you'll find that students in the years above are more than happy to give you advice. Like we are flattered. Like I'm a sixth year student now. There are students five years below me. I absolutely love it when people come to me and ask me for advice. They're like, oh, how do you how do you maximize your mark in this exam? Or have you got any tips for this? Have you got any tips for that? And I think what a lot of students sometimes feel is that kind of like, like you know, when you're in year seven, you feel like you don't really want to talk to the year tens because, oh, they're year tens and they're like scary. Maybe people have this when it comes to university stuff, when it comes to, you know, GCC, A-level stuff. Please don't have this at all. Especially when you get to university, this whole year group divide thing completely disappears. As a sixth year, I I love being friends with people in the year below. And it's, it's just like, it's, it's just flattering, it's nice. I, I like the fact that I can give advice, that I can share my notes, and the vast majority of students that I've met are in the same position. So if you are struggling with your subject, just find someone in the year above. They're like really not hard to find. You can see them around campus or around your college or around your Islamic society or your Christian union or whatever watering holes you like to spend time in. Just find people in the year above, ask them for their notes, ask them if they've got any advice for you, and generally just kind of try and make friends with people who are older than you. Uh, this is one of my kind of biggest pointers for for university life. When you're a first year, you wanna obviously make friends with you with your with your own year group, but do make an effort to, you know, try and be friends with people in second, third, maybe even fourth, fifth and fifth and sixth year. Firstly, this is important from like quite a selfish perspective that you know you can get their their perspective, their experience, you can you can take advantage of all of the pain they've been through to prepare for these same exams that you're preparing for, you can use their notes, all of that stuff. But secondly, it's also it's also just quite nice broadening broadening your like your network and kind of this whole thing about university, one of the one of the biggest perks is 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 the people you meet. And if you have been friendly with people in years above you, then it just increases your circle of friends. It makes everything a lot more, a lot more nice. You can ask them for advice. Uh, they can ask you for advice if they've got friends younger than you. And it, it just creates this nice kind of cohesive community of everyone helping each other out. And just kind of, just kind of on this note, if you're a young student, if you're a younger student trying to make friends with people in the year, in the years above, you kind of need to be the one to make the effort. And the reason for this is that, from, speaking from the perspective of a sixth year, and like I enjoy having friends in in years below. It gives a different perspective. It's just you know nice meeting new people. But I would feel kind of, kind of creepy if I were the one making most of the effort to begin with. 
uh, because it just it's, it's, it just seems a bit weird. Oh, I'm a sixth year, they're a fourth year. Uh, there's this like barrier you have as an older student, kind of trying to be friends with a younger student. At least at least initially, it just feels a little bit weird. Whereas, for example, when I was in first year, I so a, a friend of mine who was a few years above me gave me this really good advice. He said, make sure you make friends with the people in the years above. So I actively made quite a lot of effort to get to know the people in my college in the years above and the people in the Pakistan society, the Islamic society, and, and, and that sort of things. And a lot of them I'm still friends with to this day. But I think if I hadn't made the effort, if I'd kind of waited for them to extend this hand of friendship, they might have felt a bit weird about it because it's a bit it's a bit weird when you're a third year and you kind of trying to befriend a fresher. It's just, it's just it's just a bit odd. Whereas if you're that first year and you're kind of extending the hand of friendship to the third year, that's a lot more legit. And actually, this would be one of my uh, one of my massive pointers for people going into the clinical years of medical school that when you get into placements at hospitals and stuff you want to be the one to make friends with the junior doctors the fy1s the fy2s the people who are in who have been in that position like that you're in five years ago and again they want to be friends with you like i'm going to be an fy1 next year and i would like you know if there are medical students in my hospital on my ward i would love to be friends with them but i would feel weird if i were the one extending the hand of friendship it would be a lot less weird if they were the ones who you know were kind of being pally with me because then I know where I stand. I don't want to have this thing in my head, oh, you know, they're a fourth year medic and I'm a junior doctor and oh, and the female, which is even worse. What if it's seen as creepy if I'm like, oh, hey, do you want to grab a coffee and we can go over some stuff? You know, that would be great. Whereas if that fourth year medic would be like, hey, you know, are you, are you free over lunch? Can you give us a, a mini supervision? I would be like, yes, hell yes, of course I can. I would love to share my knowledge with you. I'd love to impart some wisdom. I love teaching. And literally everyone I know is in this position. So I've talked about this for quite a while. Please, please, please make friends with the people in the years above you. As the young student, you need to be the one to extend this hand of friendship and in terms of preparing for exams this comes back to you a hundredfold because people will share share with you their notes their resources all of their material their pirated pdfs of textbooks whatever you ask them for and they'll give you advice on how to do well on this exam so if you aren't doing this already please 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 make friends with and then subsequently take advantage of people in the years above Okay, so that was my four tips on how to do well in university exams. Point number one, scope your subject. Point number two, base everything around essay plans if it's an essay subject. Point number three, if you're doing maths, engineering, physics, past papers are the way forward from what I understand. And point number four, please make friends with the people in the, people in the years above you. Ask them for help, ask them for guidance. It is the way forward. It is the way to make your whole university experience a lot more fun and a lot less stressful. Now we're gonna cut to various questions that you guys sent in a couple of weeks ago uh, for the 10,000 subscribers q and I think there are four questions aimed at university students about lectures and stuff. And then there's two questions, like random questions, so that me, my friends, Paul and Catherine, we're gonna be answering those. Again, everything's gonna be timestamped in the description below. So if you've reached the vid this far in the video, then thank you very much for watching. I hope you, I hope you found it useful so far, uh, but please look in the timestamp to see what specific questions we're answering at what timestamp, so you can kind of target those appropriately. Or you can just like watch the whole video, it doesn't really matter, whatever you like. Here are me, Paul and Catherine, answering some of the questions that you guys have sent in. How do you revise a year's worth of undergrad work in a month? Well, so the first thing you need to do is scope the subject. And then after that, then decide which bits you can chuck up, you know. Um, the most essential bits, the bits which are going to get you 80% of the marks. Zoom in on those. Absolutely. Cut it up into bite-sized chunks. How, how do you make a good revision timetable? I don't like revision timetables, you do. How do you make a good one? I always make, yeah, I always make revision timetables. So, as I said, the first thing to do is scope um, your subject. <laughs> the next thing to do is, you, every day you need to, um, so you need to cut it up into, into, into chunks that are actually feasible, realistic for you to do it. I think a lot of people come, come unstuck as well because they're like, oh, you know, today I'm going to read three chapters and actually three, you can, the maximum of work you can do is one chapter. Um, along with that, in my timetable as well, I usually put in the, the kind of things that I'm going to be doing for the day. Like if I'm visiting a friend, if I've got a dinner appointment, I'll put that in so that I can budget the amount of work I need to do. And the last thing which I'd say is also give yourself wiggle room days. So I give myself these days which are called spill days. So spill days are just, you know, for me to play around with my time within that block. And, you know, for days where I'm procrastinating, then that allows for that spill. Next question, how do you cope with the massive workload that you get in uni? I've heard that with medicine, you're not actually expected to cover every single topic before exams because there's just so much to cover. Again, scope the subject. <laughs> Work out which w w what the what the pointless detail is. That's you know for those kids coming top of the year, and spend your time focusing on the stuff you know the bread and butter that's going to get you most of the marks. Also, especially in stuff like medicine, the workload really isn't that bad. I think a lot of medics and like my brother, he did he did maths. He gets really annoyed about this because this is all medics talk about. Medics love to talk about how bloody hard their degree is and how much workload there is and everyone from the age of like 12 who's even thinking of doing medicine gets fed this narrative of 
oh my god, medicine is so, so, so hard. It's so much work. It's such a dump jump between A-level and university. Yeah, there is a jump between A-level and university. Yes, there is a lot of work. But like, it's not that medicine is conceptually hard. It, there's just a load of content to cover and you can do it. Arguably something like maths or engineering is a lot harder where you actually have to think. Whereas medicine, you just you just, you just just memorize stuff. And there are techniques to memorize stuff like, you know, space repetition, active recall. If you're applying to medicine or if you've got an offer of medicine or even if you're a medical student, let's try and, you know, break this narrative of, oh my God, medicine is so hard. I'm so hard done by because I'm doing medicine and it's such, such hard work. Come on, we can do it. It's fine, it's doable. But I actually think this is more of a philosophical thing, right? Okay. Part of the reason why people think there's a big jump between school and university, and part of the reason why people think that medicine is harder than, I don't know, another subject that has less content-wise, even though it might be more conceptually difficult, is because with medicine, because there are a lot of detailed facts you can learn, it can kind of go on forever. And you have to be good at setting that point at which you decide, okay, I'm gonna learn this much, and I'm not gonna learn all the, you know, hundredth, two hundredth causes of atrial fibrillation, because actually that's not what's relevant, that's not what's important. I need to cover the bare bones and the basics first, and then I can build up from there. And, you know, it's part of the reason people find it so difficult is because they just feel like they could go on forever and that they've got to study study 24 seven, but that really doesn't have to be the case. You need to know enough to be a competent, safe doctor, uh, and you don't need to carry on studying forever and ever until, you know, you tie yourself to death. Yeah, very good point. Okay, next question. Um, how do you get through recommended and independent reading quickly? So this is sort of for subjects that require wider reading that give you reading lists. Oh my gosh. When I was doing my third year, uh, you know, most people do something like, I don't know, psychology, uh, which is at least relevant to medicine, so you, you, you know where you stand a little bit. Whereas I apparently thought it was a good idea to do um, politics, psychology, and sociology. So it was a little bit out of my depth doing an art subject that I had no experience of, not even A-level. So um, one of the best tips that someone gave me was to read book reviews, because this is a bit of a cheat, because in a book review, it tends to give you a summary of what the book said, and then also gives you some critique of the book. Um, so it was actually super useful in getting through, uh, you know, getting an overall idea of the text that I just couldn't physically get through because my reading speed was so poor because I had not read in those kind of volumes uh -huh. um, since school. Yeah, that is. Um, another tip that I have for getting through reading is that don't bother reading the whole book. Ha have, a, have a goal with mind, read with a goal in mind. Mm. Uh, I find this, mm. I, I find it really useful to structure my revision around an essay title, like do animals have a theory of mind? Then like all the 20 different papers that are on the reading list and five textbooks, I, I'm fully just intently focused on answering that question. Anything that doesn't directly answer that question, I throw away. If it does, and it sounds nice, I'll memorize that paragraph, put it into my flashcard deck and regurgitate it in the exam with a bit of, you know, addition so it doesn't like, but with a bit of editing so that it doesn't look like plagiarism. <laughs> so, um, so some quick fire tips I would say are, first of all, review papers are the best. Like then from there you can link to your primary research. And secondly, to just to reiterate what Ali said, read with a goal in mind. So for example, for me, usually I re reverse engineer it. I think this is a point I want to make in my essay. Then I go on Google and I look for research or literature that's, that supports it and then find the paragraph that supports it yeah. and then quote the paper. And then there you go. It, you don't need to read the whole it's, thing. It's all about quoting papers without having actually read them. You find those papers in reviews, like, you know. So, so, so for example, in, in, in one of my psychology essays about IQ, I, in, in, in the introduction, I would have said, uh, gender differences in intelligence and IQ have been uh, being studied for, for, uh, for centuries. Quote, uh, you know, someone from 1902. I obviously haven't read this person's 1902 paper or that person's 1775 paper, but I read the fact that he said that in some other paper and I'm gonna reference it and act as if I've read that paper. You know, so, so you get what I mean? So you're making the reference from the sentence without actually reading the paper. And I think that's a good way of getting through the stuff very quickly. Or you can even just Google history of IQ research, find the right paper and then just quote him straight away. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you don't need to read the paper. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, next question. Um, rough process from getting introduced to a lecture course and then steps taken to make the revision material for it. Do you make flashcards throughout the year? Do you look at exams papers first? This is asking from a Bynatsky. Oh, hello. So I'd say um, it's all it's up to you because uh, different people have different studying, st studying styles and, and what they prefer. Understanding is very important. We talked that we talked about that before. Are you able to explain this to somebody else? Um, and then after that, active recall is very important, but that, that comes when you're trying to revise it. So yeah, so so what I would do with lecture courses is 
if 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 the lecture notes are good, I don't I don't make any notes at all. All I make is questions. So I make questions based on the lecture notes, and yeah, I then, then I then answer them. And if I can't answer one, I'll find the answer in the lecture notes. So that's kind of practicing active recall. If the lecture notes are really bad, then you kind of have to make notes because you have no other choice. So you try and find a review paper, try and find a revision guide, try and find some guy on some forum who's like written the notes out for you. Um, anything to avoid having to make notes yourself, but cool. sometimes it's necessary. Yeah, look for the smart, helpful guy in your in your course. Yeah, ask yeah. ask someone like Paul. Paul can <laughs> kind of have your notes, or ask you know friends in the year above, you know, from your own college or from you know the Islamic Society or from the Singapore Society, like any, literally anything. There's so many so many people in years above willing yeah. to share the notes with you, so you it's don't true. have to do it yourself. Yeah. Crowdsourcing. Crowd, uh, get, crowdsourcing getting, is the dream. It's all about your mates, right? Yeah, we're Which... a team against the world. <laughs> Which leads on well to the next question. What is your opinion on pre-made notes? We love them. We love pre-made notes. We do, uh, I don't really like pre-made flashcards because I think pre-made flashcards kind of defeat the purpose and making the flashcard encourages you to think enough to you know, actually make it. But pre-made notes are glorious. I want to say though that I know some people, I know a lot of people actually, like Marcus, who, who love uh, making notes for their own revision. Like they learn by making the notes itself. Um, I think, if that's your setting style, then go for it. Yeah, I think, um, especially if you don't quite understand the topic, you haven't quite got to grips with it, then making your own notes can be a really important yeah. part of that process. Well, I mean, I mean, for people like him, then with after they've made their notes, they can immediately they can picture in their mind where that bit of information was, and then that helps them. So if that's you, then go for it. Yeah, and then you can share your notes with people who leech off you <laughs> for pre-made notes. Yeah, yeah, truly. Um, so like all this stuff that I've, I've been preaching about recently about, you know, there's, there's no point making notes, it's a waste of time. The, all of this stuff is purely aimed at people who are making notes and who are not happy with their results. If you're the sort of person that spends eight hours making notes and you're getting the A stars, you're getting the sick results, then please continue, by all means, continue making your notes. But if you're the sort of person that spends eight hours making notes and then you're thinking nothing's going in, then maybe it's time to maybe, maybe rethink that, try some of these other methods. You know, th that's what I'm saying. Don't feel like, you know, just because we say making notes are sometimes a waste of time that, you know, it's it's a one size fits all solution. Active recall, however, is a one size fits all solution because active recall is a way of life. Great. Uh, approaching the end, second penultimate question. What is your favorite stationery to work with? G207 gel blue pens. <laughs> G G G207 gel blue pens. Yeah, made by Pilot. I've used that all my exam life. Oh. Wow. He, he does really well in exams. G207 Pilot <laughs> Blue Pens. That's the secret, guys. That's how you do right, it. Right, link below on Amazon, and then you can... Oh, affiliate link, yeah. Oh, please please click my cents. affiliate link. All my affiliate link in the description oh below. I make like 3% commission on each one. So like, <laughs> like in, the, in the last year, I've made I, in the last year, I've made like 11 pounds. I think today I made about 43p via Amazon. This is like, it's incredible. Oh, I do like those fun multicolored pens though, you know, like with four colors in one, so you can like write stuff and then you know, say say you uh, are doing a bit of active recall, you learn a topic, you then write down stuff you know about the topic or write down answers to your flashcards, whatever. Then um, I look at the original flashcard and go, hmm, I didn't remember this, this or this. Write them down in red next to it. And then come when I come back to it another time, you know, half an hour later, I can do the same thing again and, you know, label it another colour. See which I'm, bits I'm forgetting or remembering each time. Cool. Uh, and my favourite stationery is an iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil because I've gone paperless and I don't believe in wasting trees. I believe in wasting electricity instead. He believes in um, getting lots of money from Amazon affiliate links. That's why yeah. he's going for the biggest token. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah, gosh. like if, if, if you guys help click on my affiliate links, you can fund my purchases of Apple products. Please do. Those are my favorite stationery. Final question. How do you manage the long days during Ramadan in exam season? Any ideas, yeah. guys? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, I haven't experienced them before. Yeah, I have <laughs> so much to say on this subject. Yeah, um, I find one thing I like to do is I get like, you know, one of those six packs of J2O. And I stick it in the fridge and then, you know, when it's time, when it's time to break the fast, I have my date, obviously, uh, my, 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 Ooh, my eating date. Oh. Come on. <laughs> Very good. Um, and then, you know, I crack, I, I crack open a cold J2O and then I just kind of drink it in one and I feel like a real, I feel like a real baller, you know, like what, what, one He's of those people. State. He's a real baller. What, <laughs> one of those businessmen wearing a suit and tie comes home after a hard day of work in the city, pops in open a cold, cold beer. I feel the same as that that baller, but with a J2O. That's how I'm nice <laughs> days. Um, and another cheating strategy is just kind of sleep after Fajr, wake up really late, controversial. People say that kind of defeats the purpose of Ramadan, but I think that's kind of what I used to do. Um, what I did last year in exam term, the year before that, when it was kind of overlapping. But yeah, good luck. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that brings us to the end of this uh, Q&A. We've talked about a hell of a lot of stuff. I hope you found something useful. I hope you, you know, you've gained something from this. Um, 
Yep. If you've got to the end of this video, you've procrastinated enough already. <laughs> Go out and save your day. <laughs> save your day. Yeah, do some work, but you know, you, you you can still do it. A second cup motto. Mug motto. Save the day. Save the day. Sco scope, yeah. sc scope your subject. Save the day. Active recall is a way of life. There we go. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Those are your take-home messages and your take-home mugs. Yeah. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you. If you like, if you like the video, uh, if you like the video, please. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. No, so guys, it? you've not oh, watched my videos crap. enough. Oh god! <laughs> if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Ah! If you haven't sub subscribed, please do so by clicking the link below. Oh, oh, god. Yes, god. Oh, my right, god. I'll, I'll have Let's to do it. Right. Again. All right, guys. <laughs> if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so by clicking the link below. No, we don't say by clicking. Catherine, you need to watch Shit. my videos. Wait, wait, wait. So what do you want us to say? Why would right. I watch that bit okay, in the video? What, what you it's say? literally the most boring part. If you literally like, the most repetitive part. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so and I'll, I'll say goodbye. I see. Go. If you like this video, no, no, please no, go give again it a thumbs without up. him pointing at you threateningly. <laughs> <laughs> this can go in bloopers. Right, you, you know, you need to start by thank you. We've got All right, guys. Thanks very much for watching the video. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. Have a lovely evening and we'll see you in the next video. Good night and good luck with your revision. Bye bye. Bye. Wait, wait, wait. You don't, you, you don't know how much you put. Oh, no, never mind. It's fine. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Don't worry. I've got a ball.